Are you that faithful servant? Is your waist girded? Is your lamp burning? The lamp in the dark. Now there in this chapter, the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel, if we take a look at the 35th through the 48th verse there, we will see a very important, a very significant parable of Jesus. Jesus, he taught this parable, teaching us believers what we should be doing as we wait for his return, as we wait for him to come and to rapture out the church, to call us home, to meet him in the sky. Now to teach this lesson, we'll see there in this parable that Jesus, he spoke about two different types of servants. There's a master and there's two types of servants. Again, since this is a parable, we should understand that the master is representative of Christ. The servants, they are representative of those that believe. Now, the first thing that we see there in the parable that Jesus, that he teaches us about there again, comes from the 35th and the 36th verse. Where in those two verses, Jesus, he teaches us that a faithful servant should always be ready for the master's return. If we take a look at the 40th verse, this is made very clear to us by Jesus that the faithful servant should be always watching and waiting. We should always be ready. He said that in the 40th verse, be ready. The first two words that are in those in that verse, be ready, Jesus said, for the son of man, that is him. He said, the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So because the son of man, because Christ is coming at an hour that, that we do not expect, Jesus, he again said there that you, his servant, his faithful servant, you should be ready. And so again, I ask you, is your waist girded? In other words, are you dressed and ready for the return of Christ? Is your lamp, is it burning? Is it lit? Is it burning for his return? Are you awake for the return of Christ? The faithful servant, as we see there from the 37th through the 39th verse, the faithful servant, no matter the hour, the faithful servant is watching and waiting for the master's return. The faithful believer no matter the hour is watching and waiting for the return of Christ. Now, if we take a look there at the 45th and the 46th verse, I hope I'm not going too fast for you here. We'll see that Jesus, he spoke of the second type of servant. We are seeing the faithful servant, but it's time for us to look at the second type of servant. And there in the 45th and the 46th verse, we'll see that rather than watching and waiting, this servant, Jesus says, has said, my, my master is delayed. So this, this servant, this servant believes that his master is delayed. And so because this servant believes that his master is delaying, that his master is taking his time, and Jesus said that this servant begins to mistreat others, we'll see there. This servant begins to eat and drink. You know, we'll think, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. We're supposed to eat, we're supposed to drink. But this servant goes a bit beyond eating and drinking. This servant eats and drinks and gets to the point that they become drunk. And so Jesus, he said there on a day while this servant is unaware, his master would return and guess what his master would catch that servant doing. That servant wouldn't be watching. That servant wouldn't be waiting. 
In other words, that servant would be disobeyed. That's a disobedient servant, if you will. We have seen the faithful steward, the faithful servant, and now we see a disobedient, a disobedient servant. So there's a lesson here that, that we should understand that Jesus, that he has taught. Jesus, he is speaking of skepticism here when we take a look at this disobedient servant. He's speaking about how that skepticism, how it can turn into laziness. Uh-oh. Red alert. Skepticism turning into laziness. How often have you heard someone say, well, Jesus, he hasn't come back yet. That thought it then turns into, well, if he hasn't come back today and he didn't come back yesterday and he didn't come back the day before or the month before or the year before, well, maybe he isn't coming back anytime soon. Some will go so far as to say, well, if he hasn't came back yet, and it has been thousands of years, right? Well, he ain't coming at all. That skepticism, it can turn into laziness. And that laziness, it can turn into one falling asleep in their faith, in their discipline. And we have seen, I spent two months talking about this, preaching about this. We are seeing that on this journey, we must be disciplined in our walk of faith. So the last thing that we should ever do in our walk of faith is go to sleep. See, if we, if we, if we fall asleep while we are on this journey, guess what happens? We can veer off course. We can veer off the narrow path. Mm -hmm. There are many believers today who have fallen asleep in their faith. I'm going to just flat out say it, and I, I don't care who don't like it. There are many so-called believers today that's sleeping on God. They're sleeping on God. They're sleeping on their faith. They're sleeping in their discipline. Mm -hmm. And guess what has happened? as they have fallen asleep on God, as they have fallen asleep on their faith, and as they have fallen asleep on their discipline, they veered off course. They have veered off the narrow path. They have veered away from the kingdom of God. Uh-oh. And so because they have veered off track, because they have veered off path, because they have fallen asleep in their discipline, they have fallen into error. They have fallen into sin. Some, they think that, well, God, he hasn't punished me for, for me doing this or doing that. Some begin to actually believe that they're getting over on God. Uh-oh. Some actually begin to think that they're getting by God just because they don't think that they have been punished by the Lord. Are you one of those that think that they can get over on God? Are you one of those that think that you can get by, that you're slipping by the Lord's eyes in your own doing today? If, if you, if you really if you're really thinking that you're getting over on God, if you think that you can slip by God, just ask the children of Israel what happened to them at Mount Sinai when they couldn't wait for Moses to come out of the mountain. And they decided that they were going to build a calf of gold and they were going to worship the calf of gold and call that calf of gold their God. Guess what happened to them? If you think, that, that you can somehow slip by the eyes of God in your wrongdoing, in your sin, think again. You see, many today, because they are asleep, they have turned away from the Lord. And I'm going to flat out again say it. 
There are many today who, like the children of Israel, they're worshiping the calf of gold. They're worshiping the calf of gold. They're falling for that calf of gold. All of his lies, they, they're praising that calf of gold like that calf of gold is God. If you think that you can slip your own doing by God, I want you to understand today that there is no fooling God. There is no getting by God. God, he is not a man to be fooled. He is God. He is the sovereign. He is the almighty. He is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. He's everywhere at all times. You may fall asleep in your faith, but God, he ain't never asleep. And even more important, what we see here in this parable today is that Jesus, he said there that God is not maybe, not might. Jesus said God is coming. Now, when he comes, the servant, we're told there in the 47th verse, the servant that knew his master's will and did not do accordingly, Jesus said that that servant will be judged. In the 48th verse, Jesus, he said there that when he comes, those that did not know his will, but again, they erred. Jesus, he said of them as well, that they too will be judged. Again, we should know very well. And again, this is talking about servants. This is talking about believers, whether they are faithful or whether they are disobedient, whether they are watching and waiting or whether they have gotten lazy, whether they have fallen asleep in their faith, we should know that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. All will appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul said. He said that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether it is good or whether it is bad. Every servant of God will stand judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. And I have been saying that a lot recently because I feel as I look out at the world today that there are many who profess to be of faith, but they live life as if they are not going to be judged by the Lord. And again, something that all of us must understand today, it's not just the sinner that will be judged by the Lord. The believer is going to be judged as well. And, and that, to me, that is something that should terrify us. To have to stand before the Lord and God is going to judge all the things that we have done in our bodies. So by the conclusion of this parable, we're in the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel, by the way. By the conclusion of this parable, I started at the 35th verse and I went down to the 51st verse. By the conclusion, we should have now a sense for what our calling is as born again believers, as a child of God. Our calling is for us to be watching and waiting. Every second that we live, we should be watching and waiting for Christ. As if Christ will return the next second. That calls on us to be, again, obedient in our faith. We don't want to be caught acting up if Jesus came the next second. You see, there are many people today that cry about people being woke. They love to move against this, this woke movement. They like to talk against this woke movement. But I tell you today that believers, that you better be awake. I, I want you to hear me clearly here. 
the last thing that you want to happen is for Jesus to arrive and you be asleep. So if you aren't awake today, you better wake up. Don't you listen to no fools. You better wake up. Now, when we take a look at the 54th and the 55th and the 56th verse there in the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel, we'll see that after Jesus taught this parable about the faithful and then the, the lazy servant, we'll see there in that scripture that Jesus, he had a very pointed question to ask his servants there, to ask us believers. He begins it there by, by saying there in the 54th verse, he said, well, Whenever you see a cloud rising out of the West, immediately you, you say to yourself, well, hey, a shower is coming. And so, hey, that shower, it comes, he says there. And Jesus, he then said there again, looking at that scripture from the 54 through the 56 verse there, he said, when you see the south wind blow, you'll say to yourself, you'll say, hey, there's going to be hot weather. And guess what? Hot weather, it comes. Now, now, some of us, we may look at that. And we'll say, well, why did Jesus, why did Jesus start talking about that? You know, it almost seems like it's just random. He was talking about this faith, these faith, this faithful and, and then his lazy servant. He was talking about when the master comes. Right. And then all of a sudden he just switches over. He's talking about the weather. Right. So it may catch us off. What is Jesus getting at here? Right. Well, let's take a look at this. You know, if we think about it, we aren't meteorologists, are we? But it's a sunny day outside right now. But if we go out the door and we look up at the sky and there's dark clouds and the wind is picked up and, and it begins to thunder, it don't take a meteorologist to go, hey, it's about to storm. So we have the ability, Jesus is talking about here, we have the ability to, to recognize. We have the ability to be observant of when the weather changes. Jesus is saying there. And so with that in mind, Jesus, he pointedly says there, again, he said, you can discern the face of the sky, but how is it you do not discern this time. Did y'all, did y'all catch what Jesus was asking there? Again, just one more time. Let me read that one more time to you. If you allow me, he said, you can discern the face of the sky. You could tell when the weather is changing. Jesus says there, but how is it? You do not discern this time. In other words, how can you not tell the hour in which you are living in. How can you not tell the day that you are living in? You're able to, to, to be able to tell when the weather is changing, which we, again, we can't pinpoint what the weather is like, going to be like the, the next day, but our meteorologists, they have studied and they can, they can predict pretty well what the weather is going to be for the next 10 days. They can go out as far, so far out as the next month. And so Jesus, he says that if you have the ability, us regular Joes, right? If we had the ability to step outside and we can look at the sky, we can go, hey, it looks like it's going to be a nice day today. How can we not tell the hour in which we are living in? Let me tell you something. We believers, we need to realize the hour in which we are living in today. We must come to recognize the world that we are living in, the time, the day, and the age that we are living in. If you are unable to tell the hour in which you are living in, I would say to you today, be observant. If you can't tell the world that you're living in today, be observant. And I want you to understand, I'm not talking about being just observant with your eyes. We ought to be observant with our soul as well. John, he said that we are to test the spirits by our spirit. 
In order for us to recognize the world that we are living in today, we can't just look at the world with our eyes and our ears. Because you see, the eyes and the ears, they deceive. But your spirit won't deceive you if you are discerning through the Holy Spirit. If you discern through the Holy Spirit, you will be able to recognize the world that you're living in. You'll be able to recognize the truth. And so why is it that Jesus said that we need to be able to recognize the world that we are living in today? I tell you that Jesus, he said that because when we look out at the world today, we can find the role in which we are to serve in this world. Again, this message is about our calling, the role that we are to serve as born again believers. And I said that this message, this sermon today is about our high calling and the believer. If the believer is simply observant of the world that they live in, that we live in today, we would know we will find our purpose. We will know what we are to do in this world today. Do you recognize the day and the hour and the time that you are living in now? We must be observant of the world that we are living in. You see, when I look out at the world today through my discernment, I see a bunch of unrest. I don't know what you observe, but that's what I observe. The world that we live in, I see a bunch of unrest. And if I had to be frank, I would say to all of you that I can't remember a time where there wasn't any unrest in the world. You see, I can't remember a time where there wasn't any fighting going on in the world while I have been alive. And then, hey, if I look back at history, that's all I see. There's a bunch of fighting, a bunch of unrest, a bunch of mess in the world. As Paul said to Timothy about times of peril, of peril, he said that there would be much hysteria in the world. There is hysteria in the world today. There's much lies, conspiracies. There are many deceptions in the world today. And as I said in my sermon last week, all of it is being stirred up to create a whole bunch of confusion. Again, unrest in the world. When, when we are observant of the world, many of us, we look out at the world today and we say, man, this world, it's a terrible place. This world, it is indeed a terrible place. It is a dark, dark, dark world, which much with much wickedness, and with much evil in the world. Malice intent is present in our world today. And many of us, we are being soaked up into it. And because of this unrest, there have always been cries of, of bringing peace to the world. How often have you heard that one? But the question it has to be asked today, well, what is this peace that, that, that some want to bring to the world? What is peace to us? What is peace to mankind? Well, I suppose when, when mankind thinks of peace, they think of quiet. We think of quiet. We think of there being no unrest in the world. And that's what we want to bring to the world. We want to bring that quiet. We, we want to bring some rest to the world. But, but are we? Is mankind capable of actually bringing peace to the world? Think about that for a moment. You see, there are certainly some that believe they can. There are certainly many who think that they can actually bring peace to the world. However, in a cruel bit of irony, when we try to bring peace to the world, we find that our manner in trying to bring peace to the world is what stirs up all of the unrest. Just think about it. 
The unrest that comes because one man's idea of peace isn't another man's idea for peace. We can't come into agreement with what peace actually is. You see, we live in a world where a man tries to bring peace through violence. We live in a world where, where a man tries to bring peace through war. We live in a world where a man tries to bring peace through oppression, through authoritarian rule, through being kings, through being emperors, through being dictators. Some say, hey, only I can bring peace to the world. We live in a world where man tries to bring peace through prejudice, through unfair laws, laws that are not just, laws that, that aren't equal. And they parade it around like it's the greatest thing in the world. We live in a world where peace is a contest that I tell you today, man simply can't win it. Man is not capable of bringing peace to the world. I don't care how much that hurts someone to hear, but I'm going to flat out say it. Man can't do it. We can't bring peace to the world. And the reason why we can't bring peace to the world is because peace is not in our nature. You see, in our nature, man is a warmonger. In our nature, man is a liar. Uh-oh. I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes. But then again, I hope I am, because we need to hear this message today. In, in our nature, our nature, it puts us at odds against God. In our nature, we don't live in harmony with God. God had to give the world his only begotten son so that we can have the opportunity, the ability to live in harmony with him. So if we don't know Jesus, we cannot know peace. Our nature is a nature that is of sin and is sin. And as I asked in last week's message, can a singer really bring peace to the world? Think about that for a moment. How can a sinner bring peace to the world when the sinner is at odds against the Lord? You see, the sinner can't bring peace to the world because the sinner doesn't know what peace actually is. You see, peace is harmony. Peace is unity in all things and between all things. The only one that's reconciled all things to himself is Christ. The only way that one can know peace in their nature is to be in harmony with Christ. So while the sinner does not know what peace is, guess what? You, the believer, you ought to know what peace is. And the reason why you ought to know what peace is is because you have come to Christ and you have confessed Christ in your hearts and the Holy Spirit has made a home in you. And as I said in last week's sermon, the Holy Spirit is transforming you. And as I said in this week's Sunday school lesson, a change should come over you. Sin should be left in the grave. And you should be walking in newness of life. You should be walking with love in your heart. You should be walking with peace in your heart. It's peace in your heart today. And I say to you today that we have a high calling, that we have a role to play in this dark world. And you may begin to wonder, well, what is that role that I'm supposed to play in this world? What is that high calling that I have in the world? I want you to understand today that the role that you have in the world today, your high calling that you have in the world today is that as a peacemaker. 
you, the child of God, you are supposed to be a peacemaker. Do you hear me here today? Again, when we take a look at my response and reading for today, Jesus, he said there, blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Again, he said, so doing, doing. He said there, what is it that we are supposed to be, be doing? Jesus said that our waist should be girded. In other words, again, we are supposed to be dressed and ready. We should have a belt around our waist to keep our clothes up. And I'm not talking about literally there. And then Jesus, he said there that our lamp should be lit. Our lamp should be, be burning, waiting for his return. And I ask again today, are you dressed and ready for Christ? Is your lamp, is it burning for Christ? As you watch and as you wait for God, are you waiting for God today? That's something that I need to talk about as well. Waiting on God. How many of us, how many of us know what it means to wait on the Lord today? You see, I think some of us may be a bit confused on what it means to wait for God. And the reason why I say that is, is because some of us, we think that Waiting on God requires us to sit and to do nothing. That's how waiting is, right? You just wait. You don't move. And that's what many believers, that's what they do today. As they sit, they do nothing. They become lazy and they fall asleep. Uh-oh, once again. Is that what we're supposed to be doing? Nothing? While we wait for the return of Christ? Is that what you think that you should be doing today is just a whole bunch of, of nothing. Does that even sound right? Let's consider what the word wait means according to the word of God here. Now, if you turn with me over to the 11th chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, this, this, this statement waiting on God is defined for us. You see, throughout scripture, waiting on God, it speaks about having faith and hoping in the Lord. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? And if you take a look at the 11th chapter of Hebrews, you'll see a whole bunch of faith being spoken about there in that chapter. Quite possibly my favorite chapter in the Bible. If you see the seventh verse there, you see there in the seventh verse that that scripture tells us by faith, Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. He moved, we're told there in that verse. In the eighth verse, we're told by faith, Abraham obeyed. That means that he listened and he did. He obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would inherit. We'll see there in that verse. The 17th verse picks back up with Abraham there. It tells us by faith, once again, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up. Again, he moved. He offered up his son, his only son, Isaac. And if we skip all the way down to the 25th verse, we'll pick up with Moses. We're told there in that verse that by faith, Moses, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. So I ask you, after just looking at a few of those those that are mentioned there in that scripture, I would recommend all people read that 11th chapter of Hebrews. If they want to know what it means to wait on God. Do you really think that the Lord wants you to sit idle in this world today? Do you really think that God wants you to sit by the side in this world that is of unrest? Do you really think that God wants you to sit doing nothing and all of the hysteria? 
in all of the lies, in all of the deceptions, the, the mistreatment, the oppression, all of the wrongdoing. Do you really think that God wants you who should have his waist girded and his lap burning? Do you really think that God wants you to sit there and do nothing, just sit and watch it all play out? I tell you today that the Lord, he doesn't want you to sit still. You should understand that the word of God, it is a call to action. Again, I want you to hear me here clearly today. The word of God, it demands your actions. Uh, when I say your actions, I'm talking about an action of faith. An action of faith in the Lord. To all of those that choose to believe in Christ, you ought to be moving by faith in this dark world today. In this world of unrest, you ought to be moving. But how is it that you ought to be moving? Are you meant to be adding to the darkness in this world as a believer? As a child of God, are you meant to be adding to the hysteria in this dark world today? Are you meant to be adding to the wickedness in the world today? You know, we'll see there in the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel in the 51st verse. Jesus, he, he begins to tell us how he moved in the world. He said there in that verse, he said, do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? That's what many of us believe, right? But Jesus, he is asking the question there. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? He then said, I tell you, not at all, but rather division. Now that, that's going to throw many of us off. Because many of us are going to say, that don't sound right. You see, many of us, we have this misconception of, of Jesus, you know, and our misconception, it comes from all of those paintings and the movies that they like to show our imaginations that we have of Jesus. You know, we imagine Jesus being this quiet, this soft Jesus that, that didn't do anything. We, we imagine this, this peaceful Jesus. But again, I want you to understand today that our ideas, our thoughts of peace, they are wrong as well. Uh-oh. See, as we saw last week, Jesus, he's the only one that can actually bring true peace to the world. You see, in his first coming, Jesus, he caused much division. And the reason why he caused much division is because he was separate from the world. He didn't intend to cause division, but he caused division. You see, in this dark world, the Jesus that I knew, the Jesus that I know, he stood up in this world of darkness. You see, the Jesus that I know, he stood up for what's holy and what's righteousness. The Jesus that I know, he didn't stand with liars and schemers, frauds and scammers. He didn't stand with dictators and want to be dictators. He didn't stand with authoritarians and, and uh, those who would cause oppressions. He didn't stand with slave masters. You see, the Jesus that I know, he rebuked the sinner and he called the sinners to repentance. You see, the Jesus that I know, when he went into the temple and he saw the sellers at their, their tables selling in the temples, the Jesus I know, he went in and he threw over the tables. That don't sound all that peaceful to me. The Jesus that I know, when he threw over those tables, he rebuked the sellers with great authority. Rebuked. He corrected them. The Jesus that I know, he held the arrogant religious leaders, he held them accountable for all of their hypocrisy. You see, over in the 34th chapter, of Matt, uh, in, over in the 10th chapter, I should say, of Matthew's gospel in the 34th verse, 
Jesus, he shared a statement that's very similar to the 51st verse there in the 12th chapter of Luke's gospel. Your page is turning. When you get to the 10th chapter in the 34th verse, you'll see that Jesus, he said, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. Not at that moment in time. Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword is what Jesus said. See, there is this idea that that we Christians, that we are supposed to be peacemakers, but that idea of what a peacemaker is, is all wrong. Jesus was a peacemaker, but he wasn't that soft and quiet peacemaker that rolled over, that turned away from sin as if it wasn't happening. Jesus didn't do that. You see, there is this thought that we should be soft, that we should be quiet, that we should be pacifist, that we should accommodate, and that we should appease all people when they're doing wrong, that we aren't supposed to say a word, that we're supposed to turn around like it's not happening, that we are supposed to go the other way. There is this thought that we Christians, that we are supposed to keep silent in the sight of wrongdoing. But over in the fifth chapter of Leviticus and the first verse, you'll see there that scripture tells us that when you see wrong and you keep silent, you're committing a sin. You're joining in with the sin. You're agreeing with the sin. How many of us keep it silent today when our lamps should be burning? Uh Uh-oh. Oh, boy. As my dad used to say, woe in this camp. Nowhere in scripture are we told that we are supposed to keep silent in the sight of wrongdoing. Nowhere in scripture are we told that we are to keep silent in the sight of sin. We are to rebuke. Nowhere in scripture are we told to run from conflict. Nowhere in scripture are we told to, to move in a manner So that, again, the sinners won't say anything bad about us when we are standing up for what's holy and righteous. Think about that for a moment. You see, Jesus, he said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. For so doing, they did that of those who were false prophets. Jesus, he warned If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Nowhere in scripture are we told that we are going to be loved by all people. When we stand in the name of peace, when we stand in the name of God, get ready. Be ready. Be dressed. Have your lamp. Have it burning. This is what it calls on when it calls on you to wait on God. You are to move for him. You see, Jesus, he didn't tolerate sin. He stood against it. Jesus, he's a warrior of the light. Are you a warrior of the light today? Is your lamp burning? And because he stood for what is righteous and what is just in this world of darkness, He was despised by those that love the darkness. And those that that love the darkness, they they were divided to stand against Jesus. If Jesus stood against what's unfair and unjust and wicked, I ask you today, why do his so-called children, why are they for it today? We must recognize that this hour that it calls on us to stand and to light the way for what is just our high calling. We have a calling to make the good news of Christ. We have a calling to make it known in the world today. But how can we do that? How can we make the good news of Christ known when we're standing with liars? How can we make the good news of Christ known when we're standing with frauds, when we're standing with scammers, when we're standing with hypocrites, 
We were standing with those that would oppress, those that would dictate to others. And those that would stand to divide and again, create a whole bunch of hysteria and confusion in the world. How can we say that we're sharing the good news of Christ when we're standing with them who are standing in wickedness? Oh boy. You see, I don't know what kind of God that you're serving, but I serve a God that says I should be standing against sin. How can we make the good news known when our actions, when they betray the actions of Christ? Are you a lamp in the dark in this dark, dark world? Jesus, he said in eighth chapter of Luke's gospel in the 16th verse, that no one lights a lamp just to cover it up and to put it up under a bed. Is your lamp up under a bed today? Have you covered up your lamp today? You see, a lamp is lit in the dark to reveal what cannot be seen. In this dark world, a lamp, it is lit to reveal and to stand up for what is good in the eyes of the Lord. You see, one that walks without a lamp in the dark if you have your lamp lit, they going to come to you. They don't want to be in the dark if they're not a lover of the dark. You see, with that lamp, you can help lead others that may not have a lamp. You can help lead them out of the darkness. That is our high calling as God's children. See, I want you to understand that there is a reason why believers is supposed to be standing with the lamp while waiting for Christ. Just like Jesus, we cannot be afraid of the dark today. Do you hear me? Yes, this world is a dark place. Yes, there is trouble in the world, but we can't go along with it. We cannot support it. Our silence would be supporting it. Guess what? We are supposed to stand against it today. Every chance, every opportunity that we have to stand against what is unjust, what is wicked, what is unrighteous, we are to take it. So like Jesus, we must not be afraid to rebuke sin today and the sinner. We must not be afraid to, to call on repentance we must not be afraid to turn over tables in the world today. We must not be afraid to hold those who take the name of Christ in vain. We must not be afraid to hold those who are hypocrites. We must not be afraid to hold them accountable. Let us remember that with the whole armor of God, we have been given the sword of the spirit. That is the word of God. You have a lamp and you have a sword today. We have been given authority to use our sword. So I say to you today, use it. Don't you stand by and do nothing. You have been called to be a peacemaker in this world. And the hour is now for you to fulfill your calling as a peacemaker. Listen and do. Be obedient to the word of God. The hour is now for you to fight for not only your peace, but for the peace of all of those that are around you. Will you fight for peace today? Will your lamp, will you light your lamp to burn in this dark world? Amen. 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 Hey there, thanks for watching this week's sermon. I hope that you enjoyed this week's sermon. I hope again that you took something out of this week's sermon that you can apply it to yourself and that you can walk in it, that you can live by faith. Make sure that you share this week's message. Make sure you're sharing it with someone somewhere. And again, I hope that you'll come back for next week's sermon. Make sure that you're following the channel so that you don't miss the next notification for next week's sermon so that you don't miss a notification for the Sunday school lessons, the Bible studies or the food for thoughts as well. Make sure that you're following the channel today.